I think we've seen the hostile takeover from the response of the dubia. And um, this plan of manipulation is what Zen has called the Senate. I believe the whole point of this is not to be clear. This seems to be the modus operandi for the last 10 years. And hey, my friends, what a week. So first of all, we thought we had the biggest story of the day starting the week when we learned of the five dubia cardinals and their dubia. Well, no, that got bumped very quickly because the same day, the Vatican responded, saying, hey, by the way, five dubia cardinals, you never released Pope Francis's response. What was the response? They released it. In the response, no wonder why the dubia cardinals didn't release it, because in the response, it, Pope Francis basically says... Priests, decide for yourselves if you're going to do blessings of homosexual unions. And if that's not bad enough, then after that, the next day, we have the release of Pope Francis's new encyclical, uh, or encyclical, excuse me, exhortation on the environment, uh, another Laudato Si, this time Laudato Deum, where, again, calling for world government and also blaming climate change on people, saying this is a disaster for the future. You can already hear what's coming. And... We also had intervention by Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, and this is very serious indeed. He lays out a case, which I've never heard before, as to why he thinks Pope Francis is not Pope. We're going to unpack all that and much more on this episode of Faith and Reason. Stay tuned. Hey, my friends, now is the time to stand up and fight. We are just about to have the Synod on Synodality, and everything that you've seen indicates that it's going to be an absolute disaster. We have Father James Martin as a personal appointee of the Pope speaking at it. We've got Cardinal Supic, Cardinal Tobin. These picks of the Pope to engage in this Synod are indicative of where we're going. We're going into heresy. And at these times of great crisis, the church, especially those called in the laity to work for the glory of Christ in his church, are called to gather and strategize. Back in 2014, LifeSite launched something called Rome Life Forum. It was a gathering at that point of some 75 life and family leaders from all around the world to strategize as to what we could do. And when we gathered, the majority of people were most concerned about what? About Pope Francis, about what was going on in Rome. But this was 2014, but the life and family leaders saw it first. Now, a decade on, we are confronted with some of the most severe challenges the church has ever faced. And so our tradition at LifeSite is to continue with Rome Life Forum, which has continued every year until we had to take a break over COVID because we weren't permitted, but we're starting it up again. Please come, if you feel so called, to Rome, October 31st, and November 1st, the very end of the Synod on Synodality, and uh, we'll be there to strategize with His Eminence, with His Excellency, and with many life and family leaders from around the world. For LifeSite News, this is John Henry Weston, and may God bless you. There's your father, Charles Murr. So good to be with you again. Always a pleasure to be with both of you. Thank you. Father, if you wouldn't mind, lead us off with a prayer, please. Certainly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Name. Seed of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, absolutely unbelievable news. Starting off the week, first of all, with the, um, you know, the dubia, and we thought everything was good. We had Cardinals Burke, Sarah, Zen, Brandtmüller, and Sandoval all doing a new dubia. We had, of course, the four dubia from before never answered, but stunningly, we find out it was indeed answered by Pope Francis. Liz, do you have details for us? Yes. Well, we knew October was going to be a wild ride, but we had it has really started off um, 
in in an absolute frantic um, pitch. Uh, the dubia was submitted, those are questions, submitted to Pope Francis um, on July 10th, I believe, um, of this year. And they were formulated by the, the five questions formulated by the five cardinals, as you pointed out. Um, on July 11th, a day later, those dubia were answered. Now, there's lots of speculation from the Vaticanistas um, that uh, they were responded to by Archbishop Fernandez, the new head of the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. <clears throat> um, and what happened was the answers were not released by the dubia cardinals. They instead came back, I think it was a month or two later, with reformated formulated questions, um, forcing the Pope to respond yes or no to these questions. And I think it's important for people to know is that these questions were about, um, first of all, confession. If people approach confession without the requisite um, feeling of um, guilt and and reconciliation and repentance, um, are they still entitled to the grace of confession? Um, because the Pope has said, you know, that is not necessarily what is required um, to have uh, the um, true sanctifying grace of confession. Secondly, the question that has been on everybody's mind about uh, divorce remarried, um, whether they are entitled to communion, the question of whether or not there will be a blessing of same-sex marriages, um, uh, civil unions. Additionally, um, is the synod or is, are the bishops as a whole entitled to change long-held tradition? Um, well, in fact, there was, it was a very curious response. It was very typically, um, I would say, typically for Fernandez, um, he used the word pastoral prudence. So, Father, you know, we're going to see pastoral prudence thrown around like listening and dialogue again. Um, and um, so they reformulated the question. It, it, it was very vague, some of the answers, but clearly what was coming through was that there was going to be a change. In fact, you know, what was interesting to me was that um, why are we having a synod when many of the questions of the synod have already been answered by Pope Francis? It's almost like calling a parliamentary me meeting and, and saying, well, the bills have all been passed. You can just go through the motions of um, passing bills that I have told you are going to be passed. So that to me is is very curious. There was also another dubia, um, which was submitted by... I think another bishop, I'm not sure where it Cardinal, is. Cardinal Duda. Yes. And that was asking about um, the divorced remarried with respect to the footnote, whatever it was, 80 something in Amoris Laetitia. And Francis responded, yes, yes. The footnote is what is controlling um, that, yes, there will be a blessing. Um, he approves it. The Vatican approves the blessing of divorced and remarried, not, not a blessing, but they can receive communion, um, holy communion, divorced and remarried of people in irregular unions. So there was a tremendous amount, you know, almost a data dump of um, moral teaching that was thrown up. Um, and, um, and interestingly, um, they, the second set of dubia questions that were reformulated in either yes or no answers have not been answered by um, by the Vatican. And Fernandez has basically said, look, we gave you your answers. How many times are you going to come back to us for more and more answers? So, you know, in my mind, um, this is, um, I, I was very, very troubled by um, this, you know, th these events because we were told um, in the Instrumentum Laboris that all of these questions were going to be the subject of the Synod Fathers, the listening and dialogue. But yet Francis and Fernandez have said that these have all been decided. This is, you know, the, he has telegraphed exactly what he wants. Um, and, um, you know, 
I think this is what has actually prompted um, Cardinal Zen, who has written to all the bishops and cardinals at the Senate, urging them to petition Pope Francis to change the procedures for the Synod and to challenge the synodal organizers in the program for this um, session. Look, Cardinal Zen can spot a manipulation a mile away after spending a lifetime with the CCP, right? He sees, he sees the handwriting on the wall about the Synod. He sees that the issues that were supposed to be discussed by these 400 participants um, have already been decided apparently. So, um, this is, in many respects, what Cardinal Pell called a toxic nightmare. It is also very much um, a hostile takeover. I think we've seen the hostile takeover from the response of the dubia. And um, this plan of manipulation is what Zen has called the synod. So we've got the dubia being answered with the answers that are extremely troubling and contrary to church teaching of 2,000 years. And then we have a synod that is supposed to um, reformulate all these magisterium truths and put its own stamp on what the Pope has said um, in the dubia. So um, it's it's going to be a wild ride. I think, you know, um, Cardinal Mueller is going to be at the Synod. Um, and I think we need to um, be prepared for um, a great deal of chaos and um, going on in the Synod. Um, and we'll we're going to see how this actually plays out. But um, the dubia questions and answers are very, very disturbing. Father, your take. They're certainly disturbing. Uh, I would add uh, one thing to, uh, to, to what Liz brought out beautifully. Uh, it's, and I think it's subtle. It's a subtle addition to this whole thing. When the five cardinals wrote and asked for clarification. I love this clarification, transparency, openness, truth, truth, truth. That's what they want. When they wrote and asked for this, they were given another whole set of confusing, contradictory answers. Then they wrote back, and, and I love this too. They were told, I believe by Fernandez, that the Pope is not their slave. Uh, to be answering uh, their questions. Well, excuse me. <laughs> One of his titles is the Servo Servorum Dei. <laughs> he's the servant of the servants of God. Yet, you know, if he's not a servant for the servants of God, for his own cardinals, for goodness sake. Well, the, the five cardinals then answered back, and I think this is not to be lost. They answered back, and they said, We'd like to give you a list of questions of our five concerns in a much simpler and straightforward uh, forum. Answer yes and no. Well, that goes back to something very, very important to the consecration of bishops. When a bishop is consecrated, he kneels before the bishop who is going to consecrate him. The gospel is laid upon his shoulders. And he is asked to make an oath, to take an oath, that when he says yes, it is yes. And when he says no, it is no. Which, of course, is from the gospel. This is what our Lord said to his apostles. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And I think when these five, these are, these are not stupid men. They're, 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 the five of them are very intelligent, prepared men. And I think when they wrote it, it, for clarification, they they put that that yes and no, that see and no, as a as a reminder to to Francis that he is in fact a bishop as they are bishops, and he is obliged to speak clearly, yes or no. That's ex I think that's what I think that's the reference, and I think that that might have that might have uh, we used to say when we were riding horses. <laughs> A, a, a spur might have gotten under a saddle that might have irritated a little bit that they, they were asking for such clarification uh yes i i believe that's that was and and even at that even at that uh they couldn't be answered in a, in a clear way um uh, you know it reminds me so often of, of when when you've got lawyers in a in a court scene they're saying uh, mr so-and-so just answer the question yes or no this 
And if they're politicians and you're waiting for an answer, yeah, well, in 1928 and this, no, no, just yes or no. And they, it's, it's very difficult to get them there because they don't want to answer that way. They don't want to be clear. And I believe, and I'll, I'll stop talking at this point, I believe the whole point of this is not to be clear. This seems to be the modus operandi for the last 10 years, not being clear. Uh, and let me just, let me just one, one, last, one last thing, John, John Henry, this, this kills me. To, to say, I'll leave it up to, the, to, to individual priests to decide whether they're going to bless these things or not. You know, this is outrageous. I mean, I, I don't know how to address it. I really don't know how to address it. I, I've told on, an, on another program, an interview, when I was in Mexico, just a, 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 a young priest, a man came into the to the to the uh, sacristy and asked me to bless a knife that he had. And I, and I, I said, I said, well, <laughs> I'm looking up in the in the rituale knives. Right? <laughs> They're blessings for everything. Right. Uh, I said, why do you need a blessing for the knife? He said, because he was, I think he was going to kill his wife, but I'm not sure if it was his wife or so, or or someone else. But he was going to kill somebody. I, I I looked at him. I said, "Are you kidding? I can't bless it. I can't bless a, a, a knife so that you can go out and kill somebody. It would. It's like the mafia coming for a blessing before they they uh, they, 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 they they do a mob hit. You, this is insane. This is crazy. Uh, so we are now given permission. If you can imagine this, we are now given permission to bless." sin <laughs> excuse me this is outrageous outrageous and and he he would throw the responsibility onto onto the priests i not it's not me it's the priests yeah. uh, unbelievable so americans woke up or catholics around the world to see these screaming mainstream headlines catholic church changes its position will bless homosexual unions and, you know, most people aren't like us following day to day what goes on. They're like, what? What? What's going on? I mean, I, I know my evangelical friends are like, what's that about? Is that possibly true? I mean, so that's what's going in. And I've seen a lot of comments by priests on Twitter. Father, you'll, I'm sure you, you go, well, if somebody presents themselves to me to bless their union and I say no, they're going to go immediately to my bishop or cardinal complaining if that bishop or cardinal is a you know friend of francis um i'm going to be canceled disciplined because you know under my conscience and as as a catholic priest i cannot bless homosexual unions it Liz, is can i can i yes. take that one step further yes listen to this i said this yesterday if during COVID, because the pope said you can decide to take the vaccine, even though it's abortion tainted, it's the lesser of evils. It's, he's opened the door. It put it the onus on the person. They could no longer claim religious exemption. So we had people lose their jobs everywhere. Do you know in Canada and much of Europe, there are anti-discrimination laws, hate crimes. What's going to happen to these priests when somebody says, a couple comes in and says, can I get my homosexual union blessed? No, I can't do that. I'm Catholic. Oh, yes, you can. The Pope said you can. So now are they committing hate crime? So it's unbelievable. The They've Pope lost has their religious opened. freedom. They've lost right. their religious freedom. And, you know, Cardinal Zen said this, and I thought this was very wise. You know, 91-year-old man said, I see clearly a whole plan of manipulation. We understand that what they mean are people who opt for a sexual morality different from that of the Catholic tradition. And the synodal organizers are speaking of a conversation in the spirit, as if it were, Father, you'll appreciate this, a magic formula. And he warned that participants should expect surprises from the spirit and that language seems to be a cover for a, and now we know he's right, a predetermined outcome in the Senate. So under, under the working of the Holy Spirit, right? Isn't that what Francis said? That the protagonist of the Senate is the Holy Spirit. Now, it's also footnoted, that comment. If you go down to the footnote, 
that was from not from scripture, not from the magisterium. That was from Francis's opening talk of the synod. So he's he's quoting himself. Um, but nevertheless, you know, someone as wily and smart and Catholic and holy um, and subjected to all sorts of manipulations by the Chinese Communist Party understands what's happening. Unbelievable. So we have this way forward now for the Senate because, as you said, basically the cat's out of the bag. Because a lot of people thought going in, well, we have the rules in place. We'll never be able to bless sin. We'll never be able to have women's ordination. So all the synod will do is kind of maybe make things a little bit, you know, ambiguous and whatever, whatever. Well, we have, we have now the Pope making it, sort of opening the door to all of this. The Pope can't say that it's legit to do it, but he just has. And the Pope can't say it's possibly legit to ordain women, but he has. So he's overturned Pope John Paul II's teaching already on the ordination of women. Um, and just so that people are clear, I just want to read you the exact wording because it is sort of ambiguous, but the whole point is the teaching is very, very clear. You, you can't bless sin, as Father just said. That was said by Bishop Strickland just recently. God cannot and will not bless sin. And what God won't do, we have no right to do. But when asked the question about uh, blessing homosexual unions, Pope Francis responded this way. Pastoral prudence must adequately discern whether there are forms of blessing requested by one or more persons that do not transmit a mistaken conception of marriage. Considering that his conceptions evolve, because he believes church teaching evolves, it's very strange what he believes the the conception of marriage might be. In fact, Liz, you had noted earlier that he switched positions. Give us that if you would. Yes. In fact, just before we went on the show, I said to John Henry and Father, I said, I, look, I just found an article from 2021 that said that the Van the Vatican has not approved blessings for same sex unions, and this was this came down from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and it was affirmed by Francis. And so, you know, what happened in the last two years to change, you know, doctrine that came down from the CDF? Are we evolving that quickly? Is that, I mean, if so, um, this is all bets are off, right? Um, and, and, you know, what troubles me also about, you know, opening it up to blessings of gay unions is um, if you read the language of the instrumentum laboris of the Senate, they're going to be talking about um, LGBTQIA, po um, polygamous marriages, um, all sorts of you know relationships that are out there um, in the in the culture. So it, they're not going to stop. And hey, let's real. We all know. It was, initially, in the culture, it was oh, we're only asking for recognition of civil unions. I mean, in a not nanosecond, we were talking about marriage as you know as a law in you know ingrained in law between homosexual couples we now have a supreme court decision which affirms homosexual unions as a marriage under the law so how quickly you know you go from blessing you know that's all we want that's all we want just blessing of recognition to enshrining it as a um, law with with rights and freedoms and impact on all sorts of um, legislation as well as laws. So um, I, I suspect that there's going to be a lot more. So what are they going to do about drag queens in, in the Senate? Are, are they going to opt out? You know, we're, we're not going to talk about drag queens. Well, they're in the instrumentum laboris. What if drag queens approach mass in the, at mass and want to receive communion? Is that okay? Um, this is this is what he said. This is what Francis has set in motion. I mean, am I exaggerating, Father? I mean, I I see it. No, not at all. No, not at all. Not at all. It reminds me, though. It reminds me, though, of of a of a former president of the United States, I think in 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 2008, who was against homosexual marriage. Remember that? 
no, not we're not talking about that. We're not talking about that at all. It's it's this gradual. It's this gradual get into the water. You know, first the, your toes, then the ankles, and then your knees. You you get gradually into the whole thing. And of course, this is you know the 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 crazy thing about this, I think anyway, is that uh, we have the Anglican Communion to look at. All we have to do is look at the look look at them. It's already been done. Look what it has done to that church. Look what it's done. They're, 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 they're practically ruined. That's what we want to follow? Why would we do that? Why would you see 100 people lined up on a cliff jumping off one, one, one after the other and then stand in line? Why would you do that? There, 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 there's, there's, something, there's something very wrong here. It's not just, it's not just confusion. There is, I, I really believe there's a, there's, there's a purpose to all of this. This is being done on purpose. It's not being, this is not out of confusion and we're trying to find answers. And this, you don't try to find answers by stacking the deck. You don't try to find answers by deciding who's, who you're going to have in your, your synod. Uh, and and, and uh, the, the, the whole thing is, is bizarre. I would get back to what John Henry said, though. That's, this is fundamentally important. We are first to obey God. We are first to obey God. We cannot disobey God to obey any man, pope, president, priest, not priest. It doesn't matter. Father, mother, it doesn't matter. We are to obey God first. If this synod is coming out, is going to reach a conclusion that we are to disobey God, uh, we don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. I don't think you have a problem. Those who would disobey God have a problem because they will have left the church. It's very simple. They would have. They will have started their own church. This is and this is what I'm a little bit uh, more than a little bit afraid of. I believe that uh, a number of people are beginning their own church. I think this is. I think it's it's going to end that way. I know where I'm going to be when that happens. I'm staying with the church that Christ founded, right? But I think this is where it's going. I really do. Uh, and they're going to push the envelope until until uh, until they have their way. It's just a, it's a, it's. I, I look at so many of the so many of the cardinals and bishops as sort of uh, egocentric, my way or the highway kind of thing, and and. Uh, we're going to do this, and that's all there is to it, and, and blah, blah, blah. You know, there's something also very wrong, and we know this instinctually. We know it because Christ told it to us also. When the church, the Catholic church founded by Jesus Christ, is no different than the world that we're living in. You know there's something wrong. If you look around and you see, oh, we're, we're in perfect step with the world. <laughs> there, more than two little red flags should go up. I mean, you know, for goodness sake, there's some you're doing something wrong if you're in step with the world. And and that's where this is headed. Um I, I see a lot of politics involved in this also. A lot of politics. And I don't like that at all. Nobody's ever liked the the union of, of politics with religion. It makes us all in, uncomfortable, especially Americans, I would say, and Canadians. We we like a little bit of separation. We like that separation. We enjoy it. We find it healthy. I, I find uh, I, I find uh, uh, they're making strange bedfellows <laughs> with 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 uh, with with politics with liberal politics. Anyway, yes, that's what I think. There you go. Well, we have this, I think, revelation in a way, because I think a lot of people were wondering, well, what about those Belgian bishops that have actually been doing? homosexual blessings in Catholic churches, the priests and giving permission for that. That's already been going on. And when the German bishops voted 38 in favor of the blessings, eight opposed, 11 abstentions, and then from Rome, it was crickets. And people thought, how? What? No. They, they, oh, I know. Behind the scenes, they're like banging the gavel saying, no way, you're going into schism. That's what's happening. I'm sure it's all happening behind the scenes. Well, no. We know now that Pope Francis is opening the door. He's saying, you decide for yourselves. So it also 
undoes some of the theory around what was going to happen at this synod because a lot of people thought, nah, it's, it's not going to go there. Don't worry. It's very clear. They're just going to discuss things. And, you know, even if they discuss them, they'll come out with, meh, who cares, whatever. It's not really anything. Actually, think about this. He's basically opened the question or opened the possibility of doing it already. So because he's the Pope and because he's answering official dubia, that's that's a very, Father, I should ask you, is that not a system in the church which is very well established that the hierarchy goes to the authority, the Pope, and asks the questions for a definitive answer? And if that's the case, which I think it is, we have a definitive answer that is against the teaching of the church, but yet that's a definitive answer, is it not? Yes, yes. And and, and especially, especially the cardinals of the church. They are named by the Pope and, they are, and, and the Pope is asking them to be cardinale hinges, hinges. Uh, people that give him information and, and take from him and, and th- there's a relationship there that's very important. What the Pope is saying is, I cannot do this alone. I need people close to me that I trust. Help me. Well, those helpers are asking for for help. They're asking for help. They're asking for, show us what you mean by this. It's got to be very frustrating for these for, for, for many cardinals. We've heard from five. You can bet that there are many, many, many more who are remaining silent. You can be sure of that. Uh, and they are they are not his own men in spirit. They are not his own men. He may think they are, but he's 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 sadly mistaken. They're not. Uh, they want some answers, and the answers that they're being given are are are, are they know that they're wrong. Why do you think they're asking the question? They're asking. They're asking. The reason they're asking. One of the reasons that they're asking the question to begin with is that he himself reflect on what he's doing and saying. You know, there's a, there's another point too that I'd like to make. That you're talking about pastoral concern. Well, we always had pastoral concern with these things of, of communion for the divorced and remarried. Every priest has dealt with this problem. We can see in certain situations that, that you can make exceptions. You can, you, you can, let me give, just give you an example. Uh, this has happened to me many times as a priest. I, I told you, I don't know if I've said it here, but I'm very fond of, 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 seeking out the people who are close to death. I, I want them to have a priest. I want them to make a good confession. I want them to have the sacraments. I want them, I want their postage paid for. I want them ready to die, right? And I enjoy this. I enjoy this. To me, it's a it's a what a, a great privilege to have helped people pass from this life into the arms of Christ. Right. So I've encountered many people who are divorced and remarried. Now I, if, if the person is very sick, a lot of people with cancer, a lot of people who are bedridden and et cetera, I sit down and talk to both of them. Can the two of you live like brother and sister? And you know what the answer is normally? This, uh, this may surprise you. Well, we've been living that way for years. So what are you, what are you talking about? You think that's a big sacrifice? Is that, I've, I've, I've even had people say to me, is that the problem? Because that's not a problem. Right? right, If they give me their word that they can, they'll try. They can continue living together and they can receive the sacraments. Why? Because it would be terrible to take this man's only help, the woman who's helping him to stay alive, cooking for him, cleaning him, caring for him, and say, no, you can't live together. He's on his own. You, that's a lack of charity and a, and, a, and a grave one. Every priest knows that. We've, we've made these allowances. We understand that. I'll give you another example, too. The divorced and remarried. The people who are fine, there's no health problem, there's nothing, they're divorced and remarried, period. I've known many people who are divorced and remarried who have never missed Mass on a holy day, on a Sunday, often go to Mass during the week, have never received communion for 20, 30, 40 years. The partner dies. One of the most beautiful days in their life is the funeral where they've gone to confession and can receive Holy Communion. And I'm going to tell you something, too, as a priest. 
To me, what a great testimony that is to the real presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. To say, I can't receive you because it is you. <laughs> because it is you. It's not a symbol of you. It's you. And I'm not in a worthy state. What humility to be able to do that and to follow through with that. And many people do. Many people do. Now, it's more noticed today because everybody and his Uncle Sam goes to communion. People who haven't been to Mass for years, they'll go to a, to a funeral, to a wedding, and they receive communion. This is another difficult, another problem to be addressed at another time with, with, a, with a different Pope, uh, somebody who's serious on, 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 on really getting to the problems. But I've been getting back to my point, when people would not receive communion because they were not in a worthy state, what great witness that gave to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, right? And what humility from them. And they, all they were asking was to live long enough that this situation be remedied, that they could be in God's full grace. We've dealt with these problems for centuries. These are not new problems. And there's not a priest who doesn't have criteria back and forth to be able to look at things and, and, and what have you. I've had homosexual couples come up to me. They want to be they want to be living, participating fully in the church. Can you live as friends? Well, uh, uh, well, why don't you give it a try? Try, try that. Well, all of a sudden they could. All of a sudden they could. And they could receive communion honestly. This is fantastic. They were there was they were elated, I was elated. And I've had many people like that. I've also, I've also, I was involved with uh, with courage in, in New York. And I'm going to tell you something. I have never seen such pious, good, marvelous people in my life as those young men and women with same-sex attraction. Who, oh, my goodness, their prayer lives, their sacramental lives, their frequent confession, uh, Holy Communion every day, magnificent witnesses they're giving witness they give to say let's 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 throw all of that out and let's take another approach that everything is okay Th this is this is sacrilegious it's blasphemous it's outrageous it's outrageous there i've said my piece <laughs> now liz we just learned also this week that Cardinal Muller, the former head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, has also backed the dubia. Now, this is, um, you know, even more controversial, you might say, because he was the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith so recently. In fact, he, I think most people know, what, when the original dubia came out, he wasn't really in that much support in support of it. It was, uh, you know, controversial suggestion, especially when the correction was going to come out. He was very concerned. Um, but here he is showing his support. Yes. And also Bishop Schneider. I mean, to Father's point, you're going to see, more, you know, more and more And Cardinal Zen joined in and, you know, is becoming very, very vocal about the Synod. So um, I think, you know, that's certainly our prayer life in the next month should be for courage for those that are the Senate um, to join in um, in support of the Dubia Cardinals, um, to raise those questions in the Senate, um, to be a voice for truth and for the faith in the Senate. I, I suspect it's going to be a brawl. I really do. I think, you know, whether we find out about it or not, let, let's hope we have some, you know, saints and some martyrs for the Catholic faith in, in the Synod Hall. Um, but um, you see gradually that after 10 years, um, they've had enough. And um, it's, I think we're going to see more and more pushback to Francis. You know, frankly, there's the cardinals of the church, you know, the princes of the church, they're collaborators with the pontiff. They work together. Um, for for the faith and to be told this is how it's going to be done before they even meet in the synod and have an opportunity to discuss it, um, you know, I think that just rubs everybody the wrong way. So um, I suspect, and let's pray for some um, surprises in the synod, um, some good faithful surprises in the synod. No, I just speaking of surprises and of cardinals. 
I would just like to, to say that the fifth cardinal on, 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 who joined these the other four, uh, Cardinal Sandoval of Guadalajara, I'm going to tell you something. He's a straight shooter. This man, this man is, is no nonsense. And that he remained quiet all of this time, I was surprised. Uh, he's, he's, he was the only, he go, this man in, in Mexico has taken on the, the federal government of Mexico, especially with the assassination of his predecessor uh, in, in Guadalajara, the assassination of, of, of Cardinal Posadas. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not buying the government's uh, uh, report on that. It's not this way, it's this way. He did his own report. He did his own investigation. That, that he is now on board with this, I, I, I smiled to myself when I, when I saw his eyes. I said, this is fantastic. He's a, a, he, he's a spiritual bull. <laughs> he's a spiritual bull. Uh, he's, a, he's a force to be reckoned with. And I think this is, I think this is great. He's also uh, a Latin American. And uh, I, I, think, I think he's going to have a, a, a lot of sway. I, I was very, I was very pleased with that. And you know, it's funny too, Liz. You say we've been praying all of this time for things to happen. Well, things are happening. You know, some things are happening. There are, there are responses to that prayer. To that prayer that we make. Hello, friends. To celebrate the momentous overturning of Roe v. Wade, we at LifeSite have minted just under 10,000 of these brand new limited edition pro-life silver rounds. Now, each round is stamped with the image of the Supreme Court of the United States featuring the date that the High Court delivered this historic victory. And on the front of our pure silver rounds, LifeSite's logo surrounded by a brilliant sunburst and draped with olive branches. They, of course, commemorate our 25-year anniversary of LifeSite News. We began in 1997 in September, so September of 2022 was 25 years. These one ounce silver rounds are available from our partners at stjosephspartners.com where you can fulfill all of your silver and gold needs in this perilous time. May God bless you. One of the big things that also happened this week was Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano uh, came out with a statement, uh, a very forceful statement in which he puts forward several arguments as to why he believes Pope Francis is not the Pope. Uh, one of those uh, pertained to one of the central arguments that Bishop Athanasius Schneider uses for his position, his opposite position, which says that Francis is absolutely the Pope. Uh, Bishop Schneider's put forward many reasons for that, but one of the principal reasons he uses is that he is the Pope because he was recognized by that, by the vast majority of, he says, all cardinals and bishops, etc. Uh, and while there are, you know, notable exceptions in only two that we know of, that retired Bishop René Gracida, uh, the, um, actually Schneider's former superior, Jan Pavalenga, and also now Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, um, you know, for the most part, everybody believed that, you know, that Francis is Pope, and so therefore he's Pope, according to one of the main arguments of Schneider. But actually... Archbishop Vigano points out in his piece, that's not really the case because in this other situation, which he points to, um, at the time, most people believed that this Pope, who wasn't really the Pope, was in fact the Pope. Liz, do you have details for us? Sure. Um, it was a fascinating argument. I tend to um, really felt it was very compelling. Um, Archbishop Vigano laid out this interesting argument using many of the arguments that have been used um, with respect to you know the improper resignation or suspicious resignation of Benedict as well as the St. Gallen Mafia um, discussion um, in planning and manipulation of the conclave that elected um, Francis. Essentially, Vigano is saying that Jorge Mario Bergoglio did not have the requisite, he calls it mens re. In a mens re, in legal terms, lawyers like myself are very familiar with the requisite intent to be pope. And as you know, a pope takes an oath um, right after he's elected, you know, to uphold the magisterium, um, the the teachings of the church, um, and so. Vigano argues, going back to both the, um, the St. Gallen Mafia, the discussion and speech of 
Cardinal McCarrick, who said um, there was a influential gentleman who put pressure on um, on the the figures who were you know at the conclave beforehand, saying that Jorge Mario Bergoglio could change the church in four years. Um, also, you know, there were numerous, numerous um, friends of uh, Jorge Bergoglio in the media who said the very same thing. In four years, he can change the church. Vigano argues that um, he entered into the conclave with the intent to destroy the church. That was his charge um, from the St. Gallen Mafia to modernize it, to transform it into um, an entity of um, modernity. Um, and as a result, he did not approach the conclave and his yes did not have the proper requisite intent um, to say, yes, I will be Pope and my primary and only job is to protect the um, magisterium, the church teaching and the deposit of faith. Um, I thought it was fascinating because he go he goes back and argues all the various things that Francis has done um, in the in the last ten years. Now I would argue that he would have gotten the his total transformation, which is what we're seeing right now, in four years, had not there been COVID, which put him back, um, you know, a couple of years. Um, had there not been Benedict looking over his shoulder. They did not expect Benedict to live another nine years. And had there not been the scandalous McCara case, thanks to Vigano, which really put Francis back on his heels and forced him to spend a lot of time answering that. Um, and so as a result of that, I think the four years that had he had a normal four years, what we're seeing now in the Synod would have happened. So. Vigano was arguing something that I think is absolutely all you know, the arguments of Ed Mazza and Barnhart and others about, you know, that he um, about the resignation, about the St. Gallen Mafia are all coming together in this important issue that every pope who agrees to put on, the, you know, put on the, the white and represent, be the servant of servants, be the six, vicar of Christ, um, the successor of Peter, must have the proper intent to um, protect the Catholic Church. Um, I think it's very clear that, you know, and, and another thing that we don't know, but which I think points to this very thing, is the superior general of the Jesuits. Hans Kolvenbach warned in a very detailed and fiery um, statement when Jorge Bergoglio was being considered bishop to be named a bishop, said that Bergoglio um, should not be, does not have the requisite um, personality, temperament, very troubling um, that you know he would be suggested to be um, a bishop. Now we're talking about bishop cardinal and now pope so i i you know vigano's argument and i would really encourage people not only to listen to his video but when you're listening to it also and this is all be in the show notes to read his statement um it's it is the most powerful you know I, i've often said vigano when he writes these things that they're true to forces this to me was a very logical argument that laid out um that francis his um, his lack of um, intent, proper intent to be the Pope makes him invalid as as the uh, Pope Francis. So this is a very hard question for you, Father. Um, oh, I knew I he, knew I was going to get the hard question. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's why um, you wear the collar, Father. <laughs> yeah, lucky me. No, no, it's interesting because. Vigano does say in his document that the current situation is humanly irreconcilable. That's his quote from him. But nonetheless, he lays out this argument, and I'm no lawyer, 
But uh, in talking to Liz the other day, was telling me about mens rea and and what that means. And it's it's funny. What I thought of right away is kind of like entering into a marriage. The ends of marriage are procreation, and then the 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 being uh, united with your spouse, and you're supposed to vow to be faithful to her, and it has got to be a free decision, and so on. But the point is, if you entered a marriage with the intent of not having children, or even worse, with the intent of having relations with other, sexual relations with other women other than your wife to whom you're, the, the marriage would be invalid. Now, I'm no theologian, but that's why that argument struck me as very powerful indeed, because there's a very strong case that can be made that Pope Francis went in with a real agenda. Because if you read Julia Maloney's great book on the Sangala Mafia, the whole program's laid out. In fact, it's laid out even before the 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 San Gallen Mafia is in place with Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner had basically, in his 1972 little, what was it, dream for the church or whatever it was, laid out the whole program. Synodality, communion for divorce and remarried. Even a different take on the decision of the church vis-a-vis abortion in politics because, as he said, you know, not no party is going to uh, do everything that the church wants. The same modernist talking points that we're now hearing and why we have Pope Francis praising some of the leading abortionists in Italy and elsewhere and giving Nancy Pelosi, uh, allowing her to have communion at the papal mass when, um, on the, when her, her own bishop was saying she shouldn't. So it's stunning. So, Father, I don't know what you make of that argument, but the mens rea argument as to why um, the his acceptance of the papacy is invalid is a, st- a stunning argument. I don't know where to go with it. Yeah, it's 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 stunning. It's very very strong. Uh, I'm going to be very careful on this. I'm going to be very careful on this, and I'm not going to give my own opinion on the matter. All right. What I will say is this: everybody has an opinion. On but I think, I'll say this, in the future, the competent authorities, and I am not one of them, I'm not counted among them, I'm talking about bishops and cardinals who are responsible for this, for, for the election of a pope, and for making sure, that it's up, it, it was also up to them, up to these men, to decide that this man was, was adequate, that, it, that everything was okay. Right? They have to look at this legally. I, I do believe that in the next 10 years, there is going to be some incredible theological studies, moral studies, canonical studies on the, on the whole papal issue. I, I really do. And I think, I think who's going to come out as, a, as, a, as a, uh, uh, an illuminate man of, of his time, be, uh, uh, is is uh, John Henry Newman, who set who who in the first Vatican Council. I'm not going to get into all of that, but in the first Vatican Council, said, "I have no problem with papal infallibility, none." But to proclaim it, I have a problem because I think it's going to be taken too much. Everyone, it's going to be understood that the Pope is infallible on. On whether cornflakes or Rice Krispies in the morning for breakfast, that that on everything. I'm, I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but the, but you know you know what I'm saying on everything. And he's not, he's not. This is the whole point. And I think I think I, when I think what is going to happen after this pontificate is finished, there's going to be a whole revision on the role of the Pope and on the way the Church functions, especially in these kind of situations. We've never been through something like this. I like history. I, I, I like history. I enjoy it. And I, I like, I particularly like Catholic Church history. It's the most fascinating study in the world. It's a study of Western civilization. I don't ever recall anything like this. Nothing like this. Nothing like this. There have been confusion in three popes. And when they talk about three popes. There was only one, right? We understand that. But... Not you can understand too because the lack of communication, the lack of this. Just imagine one thing that kill, killed me trying to imagine it myself. There were people who lived in one town, and in one town, there were in one single town, there were three different bishops, 
each one belonging to a different pope. <laughs> I, this is great in one town, right? So, I mean, your brother-in-law belongs to this. <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. But, but they were resolved. All those issues are resolved. And when they were resolved, a lot of this, a lot of this is response is, is the, the response to all of this is the Council of Trent. There, were, there was such confusion that it had to be answered. And the Protestant Reformation had to be, there were questions that had to be answered. And they were recognized. And they were answered, I think, beautifully. I think we're going to have the same thing happen here. All of these questions are going to be brought really to a real council, not a, a synod on synodality with with uh, with uh, uh, men and women and lay people and bishops and this one and that one and atheists, <laughs> people who don't believe in the, in God, who don't believe in Christ. The, it, it, this is this is crazy. I was going to say insane, but uh, let me tone it down just a little bit. Crazy, but it's going to provide at least a decade of studies. Of studies and and I hope my hope is first of all I know that the church is going to be around for the to the end of the world till the second coming of Christ I have His word on that so I'm not worried about that but I think it's going to be a holier and a saner church I really do and I think a well defined church just like Trent defined things and said just a minute there's so much confusion no there are seven sacraments that, 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 that bup, 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 and explain this I think this is where we're going. So all of this chaos may not be so horrible if good comes out of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping good will come out of it. As to, as to whether, whether Jorge Bergoglio is, was or is validly elected pope or not, I don't know. I'm not going to voice him. I'm not going to go there because ultimately my opinion on the matter doesn't matter. It's the people who are in charge of that. These bishops and cardinals, I, I don't know how some of them can, can, can sleep at night. I mean that. Uh, they, if, if, especially those who knew what they were doing. I, 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 I'm not trying to sell a book here, but I'll go back to my book. And I just recall, and when I was talking to, I, I was in communica communication with Julia Maloney on her book in the St. Gal of Mafia. All of those bishops, all of those cardinals who formed the St. Gallen Mafia, were all put, named by Cardinal Sebastian Baggio, a Freemason. All of them, right? So this has been going on for years. This has been cooking. This has been stewing for a long time. And we're, it's finally coming to head. And that we're seeing this in a, in a way, good, good, good. It's about time. Uh, because also people are people are putting their cards on the table. They're saying people are admitting who they are. Remember the problem with modernism. Pius X said the problem with modernism is that they're in our seminaries, they're in our here, they're in the episcopacy, they're, and they don't let themselves be known. Well, they have finally let themselves be known, and quite clearly and vociferously. If nothing else, that has happened. I think we're in for a decade after this pontificate uh, of a real house cleaning and real soul searching and real fantastic answers. I'm 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 excited for the for the next pontificate. I really am. I look forward to it. I don't one know if I answered I your question, to... John Henry. I, well, was I, was one, one of the things I wanted to and avoided it beautifully, or what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the things I wanted to get at was just that argument. The argument that. Um, Vigano makes, not on that front, the mens rea, I think we did, but the other argument he makes with regard to the papacy, because it was one of the stronger arguments that Bishop Schneider made on that he is absolutely the Pope, is that he's recognized as such. And that was a central argument that Bishop Schneider used. Not the only one, of course. Uh, but here's what Bishop uh, Archbishop Vigano says. He says, in 1930, in, in, excuse me, 1378, after the election of Pope Urban VI, the majority of cardinals, prelates, and the people recognized Clement VII as Pope, even though he was in reality an anti-Pope. That means not elected. Uh, he was an unelected um, and not the Pope. Thirteen out of 16 cardinals questioned the validity of the election of Pope Urban due to the threat of violence from the Roman people against the sacred college. 
and even Urban's few supporters immediately retracted their election, summoning a new conclave at Fondi, which elected the anti-pope Clement VII. Even St. Vincent Ferre was convinced that Clement was the real pope, while St. Catherine of Siena sided with Urban. So that's rather stunning, especially in this that practically everyone, the majority, uh, recognized Clement VII, the antipope, as pope. Um, and so that was that was just stunning. I don't know if either of you have any any comment on that. My only comment is I will always side with Catherine of Siena <laughs> on, any, <laughs> on any question like that. Right. She uh, she was fearless and certainly um, knew uh, knew who was legitimate and who wasn't, whether they were, you know, uh, a beggar on the street or uh, or a pope. Um, and she uh, didn't keep her mouth shut. So, um, I, yeah, I think this is, is fascinating. I hope and I think it will um, continue to bring out a lot of discussion about this. And um, and, you know, <laughs> interestingly, um, when I was researching his speech, um, I came across something that Vigno had uh, written, and it was posted in a big headline in Newsweek. And he predicted, Vigno predicted that Bergoglio would legitimize homosexuality um, and um, at some point in his papacy. And I thought, wow, you know, three years ago, he was seeing the handwriting on the wall. And so here we are. Um, blessing homosexual unions. So um, this this is, you know, this is all great, right? This is, as Father said, you know, kind of all the rats are scurrying out of the holes. Um, we see who all the modernists is. I mean, I, I follow the church, but I had no idea the level of modernists, um, predators, uh, protectors, even though I had investigated these cases, um, I had no idea. And, you know, thanks to Vigano, um, thanks to the victims who have pushed forward these issues, we now know um, many of the cardinals, bishops who have protected predators, um, who've been predators themselves. Um, and so um, this is a house cleaning, as Father said, may not be nice, you know, nice and clean with a with a, um, a vacuum, but it's we're going to be able to identify who the uh, traitors to the faith are. There are some real there are some real problems, real issues that are not being answered, and some things that are being answered incorrectly. So the next decade is going to be spent on undoing all of the things that would have been proclaimed uh, in, in this in this past decade. You'll see that. And, and you know what? They'll be explained why they're wrong. Why they're wrong. And there will be a history of how, to, there'll be a history, there'll be books written on how to be wrong. Because we because all you have to do is study this last decade and you'll understand how to be wrong. I think, I think a lot, I think a lot of clarity is going to come out of this whole mess, this quagmire. I really do. I really do. It's interesting. In the in this sort of final analysis, I see some similarities between what Bishop Schneider said and what Archbishop Vigano is saying. Because if you pay attention to the fact that Archbishop Vigano actually says this is humanly irreconcilable, in other words, nothing really can be done about it. Another of Schneider's main arguments is that nobody has the power to judge Pope Francis's status as pope, and so that's interesting because. I think both of them also agree that we'll, this will take divine intervention uh, to sort out um, what, however that divine intervention comes, that's only God knows. But um, I, I tend to think so too, that it'll take divine intervention for us to get through here. Um, absolutely unbelievable. Um, we want to move on though, because it's not the only news that happened. There was also the release of Laudate Deum. Can you give us details there, Liz? Sure. Um, on the feast day of St. Francis, um, who God said, rebuild my church, as I mentioned before, I think it's important for us to keep that theme front and center. Um, I read the uh, new encyclical. Francis has certainly uh, ramped up 
um, the sky is falling, uh, the cataclysmic impact of the climate. I would just ask if Jeffrey Sachs, his favorite environmentalist, um, Bergoglio's UN minder, wrote this um, drivel. Um, Sachs is his favorite special speaker at the Vatican. Um, he's the one who constantly says the sky is falling. Um, we are at the tipping point. But I want to remind people who, if you decide to read this, and you know, it's it's it really is ramped up to a level that is just kind of insulting. Just this past week, the world's top climate scientists declared. And listen to this, the Green Agenda is a World Economic Forum depopulation scam. And they warned that there is no climate crisis. Now, this is William Happer, who is Professor Emeritus in Physics from Princeton. This is Richard Lindzen, Professor Emeritus of Atmospheric Science at MIT. Both have gone on to say that it is a hoax. Um, and I would put you know, their credentials against um, Jorge Bergoglio's high school biology student credentials at any day, including his UN bureaucrat, Jeff Sachs. Um, but what's, what's kind of insidious about this is Francis really goes after um, the Americans and um, says that the Americans are really to blame um, primarily for the climate change. And he kind of throws, you know, the, he says the Chinese are doing a lot to, you know, protect the climate, which is just absolutely absurd. Um, you know, the Chinese are building hundreds of coal-fired uh, uh, plants, power plants, um, we know that coal is a fossil fuel, fuel that awful fossil fuel. And you know, in looking at his cyclical, um, he you know, cites very rarely any structure, of course, but he cites repeatedly and in great detail UN agreements and conferences, the Paris Agreement, the United Nations, the Rio. Conference, Rio de Janeiro, the UN Framework for the Convention on Climate Change, the Copenhagen um, Conference, COP3, COP21, COP25, 26, COP27, the conference in Egypt, the conference um, upcoming one in 20, 2028 in Dubai. All of these UN conferences, folks, you know, in dealing with the climate change, the number one evil. Um, Agenda item is depopulation. So it's especially heinous that Francis points to these UN conferences as the model of behavior when, in fact, you know, this is climate change. The agenda is really to depopulate and recommending to Americans that we follow the China model. Well, is he recommending to the Western world that? Americans adopt the one China policy because after all, human beings are responsible for climate change. Um, so it's especially insidious. Um, and I would encourage people, you know, obviously he didn't write it because, you know, it has a great deal of, you know, science, you know, talk. Um, but it's, um, but I would warn people to really start start looking at this issue because first of all, John Kerry was there at the Vatican, um, this climate czar for Joe Biden in June of 2013. We saw, we saw also Soros, Alexander Soros and Bill Clinton and Francis talking at the Bill Clinton uh, initiative, global initiative just in the beginning of September, which was the you know, climate agenda uh, initiative, which was being pushed by the globalists at the Clinton um, initiative, which is, again, you know, very much in bed with Planned Parenthood and, of course, the abortion agenda. So abortion and climate change agenda go hand in hand. People have to yes. remember. Right, Father. I mean, and uh, so no, absolutely, absolutely. And it's quite it's quite you can see it quite clearly today. Yeah, and it's, it's excuse the fun, but Francis is turning up the heat in this yeah. encyclical. Panic, panic, panic. So 
what what that says to me is that it was the orders that he got from his globalist minders. Um, people aren't buying the cl- climate change hoax. They're not buying it. Um, his Holiness, please, you've got to keep pushing this agenda. That's my read of it. I got a, I got a phone call this morning from a priest, a, a, a young priest. He said, he said, Father, did you ever stop to consider that your vocation to the priesthood and my vocation to the priesthood would be linked with climate change and recycling plastic bottles <laughs> is ridiculous, ridiculous. I, I, I wish I wish you would be that excited about things that uh, uh, that really truly concern the Catholic faith. We marvelous, marvelous. I wanted to get to a couple of news, good news pieces, um, and the first one was that. Uh, Sister Dee Dee Byrne and other Catholic women leaders are demanding that the Synod support faithfulness to the church teaching. Liz, do you have details for us? Yes, um, it was uh, Janet, Dr. Janet Smith, um, our beloved Sister Dee Dee Byrne, um, also Colonel Byrne, also Dr. Byrne, um, and uh, Rachel Campos Duffy organized this letter. It's, it's going viral. Um, and what I loved about it was the you know the voice of faithful women speaking out about the synod and supporting the faithfulness of the church it was very powerful especially since um father ratcliffe op op who was the you know the radical um pro homosexualist um who gave the retreat um to the synod synod participants he's up there women women you know we got to put women at the center of the church as Francis is ignoring all the women victims of Father R- Marco Rupnik, right? That he won't meet with them as he suppresses all the women Carmels around the world, um, suppresses their magnificent vocation in their monasteries. Oh, but you know, here, here is, you know, it's the nuns and the bus. That's who they want as a center, right, Father? And so, but here we have, you know, these successful, brilliant women and doctors. Sister Dee Dee Byrne, Rachel Campos um, uh, Duffy, and Dr. Janet Smith, who's taught you know many thousands probably of seminarians, just a wonderful woman of the church. Um, so it's going to be the battle of the women, maybe. Um, I know who's going to win in the end, um, but uh, it was great to see their voice um, step into the into the fray. Um, we need it. We need it. Yeah. Father, if you want to just give us that detail, because in the new document, the the Pope does seem to leave an open door to the idea of ordaining women. Um, what's the official church teaching and what's the church's reasoning as to why this can't be? John Henry, you know those five questions that they presented to the Pope, the five, the five cardinals? I could answer all five of them in about 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Very simple. Look, it, it, it's this way. It's, 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 it, these, are, these are old arguments. They're, they're there. Our Lord had very close friends who were women. There's no question about that. This was culturally unacceptable at the time. All right? He had very close friends who were women. They followed him. Culturally unacceptable at the time. He spoke alone, a Jew spoke alone to a Samaritan woman at the well. Culturally unacceptable. As a matter of fact, I think it was St. John who first saw them together. It was scandalized. What's he doing? Talking to a woman alone. Our Lord had all the time in the world for women. He had no problem with women. Didn't dislike them. Didn't mistrust them. Loved them. Let's go back just one step. And this 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 is this is absolutely fantastic, and I love it. I love it. I love it. I love my mother. To me, she's one of the most beautiful women in the world. You love your mother. You love your mother. You remember her. She was your first love. Your first love. The way you see beauty, truth, and goodness, very much depend on that woman. Now, could you imagine? You love your mother. She was a given. You had to accept what was. In the, in the case of our Lord, he put her together. He put his own mother together. 
He gave her her intellect, her will, her brains, her personality. He gave her the color of her eyes. I, this is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Can you imagine a more perfect woman than the Blessed Virgin Mary? There, there isn't. There isn't. And yet, he did not call her to the priesthood. Right? Now, let's get into something practical. I can tell you this because I've lived long enough. And, you, and the two of you, though you don't have my years, you'll understand what I'm saying. You start ordaining. Look at the Protestants, for goodness sake. We have 35 or 30 to 36,000 different uh, thousand, uh, uh, denominations of Protestants. Many of them have women ministers. They do not have priests. They have ministers. There's an ontological difference between the priesthood and ministers, right? Look at them. And I can tell you this, where there is a woman, and, I, and there are dynamic women preachers. Some of them are, are, are incredibly talented. They know how to how to move a crowd. They know how how to how to affect and they're and they're spiritual and they're 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 telling they're talking the truth. The church is full of women. It is empty of men. And now, if that's what you want, great, you've got it. But our Lord, I, I'm playing the psychologist here. Right, our Lord chose twelve men. Why? Because of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we understand that, the 12 sons. But he also knew this. You crack those nuts and get those 12 men to be believers, and you can change the world. You'll have men and women and children coming together in a community where if you have just women, you send women out, you will have women. Our Lord didn't want that. He wanted everyone. And he knew that the way to, to do that was through these men. There's another reason, too, that I think. It's easier for women to believe in God. Why is that? Their maternity. My goodness, a woman is a, is a, a, a procreator, a co-creator, a, a procreator with God in knitting to, together uh, men and women, the future. This is something, this is phenomenal. Women almost know that God exists. It's, almost, it's not really a, a deep question of faith. They, they almost have this experience. They know because they're life givers and God is life. Now, it really costs to make men convert to the faith. I can tell you that for, for, for sure. I know that. It's cost me a lot more time with men than with women who are Protestants or Jews or Muslims even that I've, that I've had, had a convert class with over the years. Men, it takes more. They demand more. They need to see. They need to understand more. Women almost intuit the existence of God. It's, it's, it's just part of them. It's, it's an easier natural thing. Our Lord wanted those hard men because if he could convince them, they would convince the world. Men, women, children, boys, girls, cats, dogs, big, tall, everyone. Not just one particular group. The church has always seen this as doctrine. There has never been a question of this. The Orthodox churches have always held this as doctrine. There's no question of it. It's a very simple thing. Now, let me just jump into an. Okay, here's a real good question. And I keep asking this and I never get an answer. There already exists 30,000 different religions that have women on, in the pulpits. Why not go to them? And you know what they say? You know what they say? Well, it's not the same. Well, of course, it's not the same. But you've got them. That's the most important thing to you is to have a, a woman in full capacity. Yeah. No, they don't leave. And the reason they don't leave 
is because they are bent on the destruction of the church. This is not, this is not because they want women particularly to, to be priests. It's not that. It's deeper than that. They have a dislike for the church. They have a dislike of authority. They just do. Uh, there was good, I was going to make one last point, but I think I'll stop there. <laughs> I think this is it. Uh, it, it, it it's, just, it's just this has always been the teaching of the church, and it's going to continue being. I've got a surprise for you. I've got a surprise for all of our listeners. Nothing is going to change in the Catholic Church. Nothing. None of these, these points of, of faith and of doctrine are going to change. They're not going to change. They can be thrown into chaos and into confusion. We've had that before. We've had, we've had a time when, when no one except a few believed that Jesus Christ was God. I mean, do you want a more central issue? This will pass too, and it's going to remain the same. It's going to be the same because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's the same. And he'll be with it. He'll be with us and the church, and it's going to continue. And it's going to be strong. And here's here's one thing that I'll just tell you this. And I told you this the last time, I think. Didn't I tell you this, Liz, about my, my fourth grade teacher, Sister Rosalima? Yeah. Yeah. What 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 I, listen, look, I, I'm not the most I'm not the most manly man in the world. I'm not trying to do that. But I am telling you this. When you start getting again, and it's happening because I'm seeing young men coming into the priesthood who are, who are, who are men, who are men. Uh, they can move crowds too. It's attractive to see a young man who's given up everything for love of Christ and for the church. This is inspiring. It just is. Uh, we all feel good when we see that. It's, it's, it's a heroic love that this young man is trying to portray. And the, the new priests that I see, and believe me, many of them contact me. As a matter of fact, one is angry with me right now because I, I was going to have a conference call with him at 7 o'clock, and I forgot we've got this. I'm sorry. I, I, you see how I am, Liz? I, I get everything confused. But the, the young men who are coming up in, in for ordination, they're good. They're good. And, you know, they know what they're getting into. They know what they're getting into because they're walking right into the, the probably the worst time in, in, in modern times anyway to be, to be a priest. Uh, when 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 I was thinking of being a priest as a young man, oh everybody everybody praised me. What a wonderful thing! What a marvelous thing! Today they look at you like you've got ten heads. What's the matter with you? you know? So I mean, when you get when 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 there are vocations today, they're real vocations. I talked to to Bishop Strickland the other day uh, before we got on air. Uh, he has a number of seminarians, and they're good men. They're good men. He's there. It, it's going to take a lot of rebuilding to get this put to, put back together, but it's happening. It's happening, and none of these things are going to change. With just one last word, if you permit me, that somebody would come into a confessional and say, "I'm not sorry for my sins. Forgive me." <laughs> this this is the most bizarre thing I have ever heard in my life. This is. I, what are you doing here then? What, what what is this? This is this is absurd. I, I I think the man doesn't sleep at night, thinking of bizarre things to say the next day. This is this is absolutely just this is just crazy. I don't even know how you answer these things. That's why these five cardinals are saying, please give us a yes or no. Let's go. Let's get on with this. Right? He still can't do that. And again, I go back to this, and I promise to to stop talking. Our Lord said, "Don't you be the same as the Pharisees." who speak a lot, and they use a lot of words in their prayers and in their arguments. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. We can't even get that done. We can't even get that done. And he took a vow. He took an oath to that, as all bishops did. Anyway, I stopped. I rest my case. Liz, I rest my case. So let me just conclude with this. I just got back from the Catholic Identity Conference this week as well. And there were a lot of speakers. Bishop Strickland was there. Cardinal Muller spoke to us. Michael, Matt, Matt, you read. I mean, so many speakers. Ed Penton was there from Rome. Um, it was just an amazing conference. Over 700 people. Um, everyone faithful to tradition and willing to lay down their lives for the church. The talk, though, that 
struck me more than any other was that of Mark Houck. Mark Houck, the great pro-life hero, whom after he was um, accosted, arrested by the police, and they came at, you know, FBI came at gunpoint to uh, arrest him in front of his family and, and woke them all up in the middle of the night pointing guns at his kids. It was so horrific, like 20-some-odd FBI and law enforcement officers there. He told that story, but he told the after story of the charge and the likely jail. It was so stunning. He linked it to the Stations of the Cross. And it was so moving about how he described each station and its relevance to his case and how he was told, basically, he had the best lawyer. And he was told that he'd be going to jail, likely for 11 years or 10 years on the assault charge for sure. And the lawyer, he asked the lawyer, you know, will they let me go home first? Well, they normally do let you go home for like three months and spend for your family before they take you in. Unless they want to make, you know, unless they don't like you and they want to make a point with you. And he knew they want to make a point with him. That was the whole point of the whole exercise in the first place. And we saw what just happened with the FACE Act trials for uh, Joan Andrews Bell and everybody else who are in prison for 11 years. And so they were going into this court case knowing that this father of seven kids and young kids with his wife uh, would be facing this massive time in jail. And so, you know, they're there contemplating this, going forward with this. I mean, imagine what that would do to the family. And then he gets a deal. He gets offered a plea deal with nothing. No 11 years, not even probation, nothing. All you have to do is plead guilty. What does a guy do in such a situation? He doesn't want to betray the pro-life movement by pleading guilty to something that that's ridiculous. He's not guilty for He's going to ta get taken in on this charge. So, of course, he had to go talk to his wife. And he told her the plea deal. And she said, you're not going to take it, are you? Because it would hurt the movement. And she said, don't you come home if you take it. While I was there, a great priest, Father Pendergraft, he's a fraternity priest, he said, it reminds me of the women of the Vendée, who when their husbands were going to come home and fight no longer, they said, absolutely not. They were going to go themselves and fight if their husbands didn't. Made me think of Jesus. Probably the worst torture he had was not envisioning, as only he could, the crucifixion and all that went along with it. It was probably the abandoning of his mother. But what do you think she said? Amen. So be it to all that he would suffer. That's the real power of women. That self-immolation. To let her son do what he needed to do for the salvation of the world. There couldn't be a more powerful thing. So there's good, good news going on, despite all of this insanity. His father was saying, "Could I add, could I add to that?" Change. You were saying the, the mother, Please the mother ahead, of the Maccabees, the mother of the Maccabees. Oh yeah. Can you can you imagine the, the the pride of that woman, son after son after son after son, seeing them die, go die because we don't deny God. Yeah. Wow, and she's wow. talking in their own tongue so they can't understand. Yep. And um, the this story, if you, you guys haven't read the story, it's so powerful, it's not even funny. Um, if you read it in the Maccabees, and it's her sons are all being tortured and killed right in front of her. And I uh, guess to the last one, it says, yeah, go join your brothers. Unreal. Beautiful. Thank you so very much, Father and Liz, for joining us. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank, thank you, too. Beautiful. And God bless all of you. We'll see you next time on Faith and Reason.
Hi, everyone. This is John Henry Weston. We hope you enjoyed this program. To see more like it, be sure to hit the subscribe button below to get all the latest content from LifeSite News. Check the links in the description to read more and connect with us on social media so that you can stay up to date with all the latest life, family, faith, and freedom news. Thanks for watching, and may God bless you.